So good to see you guys this morning. Just want to let you guys know, so uh, for our Aspire Church family here, for those of you that are uh, interested um, or have any prayer requests, make sure that you guys remember to use those connection cards. If this is your first or second time here, we actually have these cards here for you, and you can fill this out, and you take this to the Next Steps table. It's right outside the doors there, and um, they would be happy to answer any questions that you have. If you have questions either about our church, um, any, anything like that, uh, you can come see me. You can come see the Next Steps table. I also want to thank you guys. You know, there's multiple ways in which we worship God, right? One of the ways is through music. One of the ways is by spending time with Him, sitting under the Word of God. Um, one of the ways is by our offerings and our tithes. So I want to thank you guys so much for your offerings and your tithes. One of the ways that you can do that is we have a bowl in the back for you today, and we've got some envelopes there for you if you'd like to give that way. You can also give online. You can go to our website, aspiretucson.com. There's a give button at the top, and you can give. A lot of you give that way. So thank you so much for being faithful in your giving. Um, what's really cool is we're going to be doing a class. It's starting next weekend. So next Sunday at 9 o'clock. It's a two-part. And so for those of you that are interested in going to that, what it is is it's a sharing your faith. So it, do you want to know how to share your story, the story of Jesus, in a conversational way? This class is perfect. You know, I've actually ran in and heard from a lot of you guys that that's, that's always a common thing. We can always be better and better in practicing how to share the story of Jesus with other people, right? Um, how do I do it so it's not so awkward? How do I do it where it feels more natural? I mean, this is something that, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty passionate about Jesus, and I know you guys are too. So how can we share those with the people that are around us where we work, live, and play? So that's what this class is going to be about. Um, if you are going to sign up, we do need to know, just that know who's going to be there. So go ahead. You can use the card. You can put um, your information on there and just put sharing your faith. And that means we'll assume that you're signing up for the two classes because they go back to back. You can also just scan the QR codes that we have and you can sign up that way or just send me an email and that works too. So uh, with all of that said, we're going to continue our worship this morning. So this morning... We're continuing through the book of 1 Peter, and uh, this morning we're going to be reading out of chapter 4, and we're going to be reading verses 1 through 11. So I'm going to start us off. It's always good to just start with the Word of God, right? So verse 1 says, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they're surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks, as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves, as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray real quick. Father God, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for the beautiful weather we've been having and just the, Lord, that you bless us daily in so many ways. With You bless us through beautiful weather and food on the table and a roof over our heads. And Father, we just, we come together this morning to hear from you, to hear what you have to say to us through this passage. And Father, and we just, all together, we choose to worship you. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. How has everyone's week been? Everyone have a good week? Maybe some of you not so good. Maybe some of it's been good, but you've had some difficulties or whatever. 
for me, this past week has been kind of challenging. I, at work, we just had a, one of the government contractors. For those of you who don't know, I should probably introduce myself. I'm Eric Fessler. I'm a part of the pastoral staff here. I always forget that part. Um, if you're new here, that's, I'm part of the pastoral staff. My name's Eric Fessler. My day job is I work at Raytheon. And this past week, we had a government uh, contractor come out and do an inspection on one of the programs that I work on. And to say it was stressful would be an understatement. It was digging into all kinds of stuff, found some stuff that we had to address, we had to fix. And then we also had some other program testing that didn't go as planned, so we had to shift schedules. And it was, that was stressful enough as it was. But then our dog, Sophie, she's 18 and a half years old, she got an infection in her eye and it swelled up and she started scratching at it and kind of tore her cheek. So we had to put her in the cone of shame and make a vet appointment. So this last week I had to take time off work to take her to the vet and come to find out she has had an abscess tooth and we had to have her, some of her teeth surgically removed. So it, it was just one of those things where each thing by itself wasn't that big of a deal. But I don't know about you guys, but it seems like in my life, one thing gets off track and it just seems to kind of snowball. And then it's one little thing that's not a big deal suddenly becomes this thing that just makes me want to just lose my cool. I lose perspective of what's going on. And in my family, I tend to be the one who gets irritable. And I, I kind of, things upset me and I take it out on everyone else, including the dog half the time. But at the same time, my wife Sulama She'll always pull me aside and say, you know what? I can see things are upsetting you. You need to cool down. If you don't cool down on your own, I will take you outside and hose you down. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I usually give her a scowl for a minute or two at that comment, but then that's like, I, I take a step back and I realize, okay, let's, let's put things into perspective. This is really not that big of a deal, right? The fact is we all have those moments in our lives, if we're honest with ourselves those times when things just go haywire and we're just like, why is this happening? Why does this have to happen now of all times? This is the most inconvenient time. God, why are you letting this happen to me? Right? We all have those times. And the problem is when that happens, we lose sight of the big picture. We get so focused on the problem, what we're going through, that we lose sight of the bigger picture, what we're supposed to be and how we should be reacting. I mean, you guys don't need to raise your hands, right? But how many of you would say that the past several years have been difficult or a challenge, right? I mean, I, yeah, they, a couple of you are raising your hands. Yeah, it's been difficult, right? I go, I go back, the first thing that jumps out of my mind is COVID, the dreaded C word, right? I mean, with COVID, we had like mandatory lockdowns. We had, you had to isolate yourself. You weren't allowed to see loved ones. And then we have all of this stuff that's just with COVID where, I mean, you school shutting down, businesses shutting down, people were losing their jobs and everything. And then on top of COVID, the economy has just been out of control. Food prices have, I mean, how many of you are feeling the crunch of food prices? It's, just, it's painful. And then we have gas prices going up. And then constant conflict in Ukraine, and now everything that's been erupting in Israel and the Middle East. And that's just conflict that's going on, but now we have Russia and China and Iran and North Korea threatening that they're going to go to war with us and everything. And it's just like, oh my gosh, I've had enough. Can I tap out, please? This is too much. People are at a breaking point. How many of you would agree with that? One statistic that I was just looking up the other day, and this is for 2024 alone. It doesn't have anything to do, I mean, we're not even through 2024 yet, but so far statistically, 218 murders, 12,610 injuries related to road rage alone. That's just road rage. And I mean, I get it. I get irritated with people on the road too, but that's, that's indicative of what's going on in our culture, what's going on in people's lives. People are at a breaking point. And I don't bring all this up to add to anyone's stress or anxiety. I can see some of you already like, oh, geez. I just bring that up to point out that life is stressful. There's issues going on in all of our lives that, and if we're not careful, they can easily overwhelm us. They can easily steal our attention and we get focused on that and we lose sight of the big picture, which is what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna be talking about, okay, as believers, as Christians, 
How should we respond? How should we live in a world that just seems to be getting crazier and more hectic and more stressful? How, how should we live our lives? And what's great is the book of 1 Peter that we've been going through, it's very applicable to that. It, it really, Peter really lays out how we should be responding, how we should live in a world that sometimes feels a little crazy, right? This past week, in our small groups, we finished 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 22. Um, what we've been doing, we've been in very intentional about it in our small groups. As we're going through the book of 1 Peter, we're only covering the first part of each chapter on Sunday morning because we're expecting our small groups to complete the last half. So we're not trying to skip over any part. In fact, I think in small groups, sometimes our small group that we're in, we dig in and we just really enjoy going through the last part and, and studying through that. So I just want to encourage you, if you're like, well, wait, we just did the first, but we didn't finish chapter three last week. We're doing that in small groups, and I would encourage you to, to join a small group. If you're only here for a season, for a short period of time, because you're, you're here on a vacation or you're visiting family, jump into a small group for the time you're here. Small groups would love to have you, because that's really where we dig in, and we go through the whole book of the Bible that way. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Yeah. So... What I do want to talk about, though, today is at the end of uh, chapter 3, Peter was talking about suffering. He was talking about the suffering that we go through and how we submit ourselves to God in the midst of suffering. And he goes on with that, and he continues that thought in chapter 4. And for those of you who are note-takers, I'm going to let you know kind of my outline up front. There's going to be four points today. So you know what to expect. And the four points that we're going to be going over are be prepared, be different, be praying, and be on mission. All right, and we're going to, I'm going to go in and I'm going to explain a little bit more in depth what Peter's actually telling us in each of those. But I like it when I kind of know the game plan ahead of time, so I'm just giving you guys that option. So what Peter's talking about, though, is this early church, at the time they were going through, they were under severe persecution. Like Brian mentioned last week, Nero was the emperor, and he was one bad hombre. He was not good at all. I mean, you can go back and read history. He was brutal to people if they were Christians. I mean, we, talk, we sometimes think that we're persecuted in what we go through because people mock us or laugh at us at work or something. Their lives were, they were tortured mercilessly, and it was horrible. And what Peter's talking about is like, hey, in the midst of that, in the midst of difficulty, this is how you live. This is how you, how you move forward. And the first thing he tells us is be prepared. We are prepared by, let's look at verse 1, chapter 4. It says, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. As I was going through this, the one, one phrase stood out to me, and I think it's kind of a key part of this, this verse, and that is, arm yourself. It just, to me, it seemed a little weird that it, he was saying to arm yourselves in the midst of suffering, right? So I looked it up. The Greek word for that phrase is hoplizo. It's a Greek word, and it's derived from another Greek word called hoplon, which hoplon is a reference to a tool or a weapon of war. It's, it's a physical, like a sword or a spear, or in our common day vernacular, it would be a gun or something like that. In hoplizo, this is the only place in the New Testament that this Greek verb is used. And what it's typically in the Greek language, it's used to imply two things, either a physical application or a me uh, metaphorical. Got a little tongue tied there. Maybe I should have some water. Physically, what it means to hoplizo means to physically take up a weapon of war, to arm yourselves. And it's not, I'm a Second Amendment kind of guy. I, I, I'm a hunter. I do all of that, that kind of crazy stuff. And this isn't implying walking around carry conceal. Well, I'm armed. I'm hoplizo. I'm, I'm armed. This image that he gives is physically drawing and you're ready for action. It's, it's not just like, oh, I have a weapon. I'm, I can use it if I need it, but it is, you are poised and ready. You're expecting 
an assault at any given moment. The metaphorical use, version used of hoplizo, which I believe is what's being used here, is to mentally prepare your mind for war. You're, you're mentally prepared for action. I'm sure if any of you have ever been in the military or faced combat, you understand what it means to mentally be prepared for battle. It's, it's, it's different. You, you can be trained, you can be ready, but there's a difference between actually being mentally prepared. One example I thought of is my daughter, Emery. She does jujitsu, and she, she teaches a women's class. She's all into it. She loves it. It's, it's crazy. I never would have imagined seeing her getting into that. But she competes all the time. And, you know, when she's, when she's training, you know, she'll be joking, she'll be laughing, having fun. But when she goes to a competition, she'll separate herself from everyone else. And it's kind of weird to look and watch her because you can see this, like, change where she's just mentally preparing herself. And she's, I call it putting on her warrior mindset. She's stepping back and, like, she's being prepared, like, going through, okay, what am I going to do? I'm going to do, if they go this direction, I'm going to pivot and do this. And it's being mentally prepared. That's hoplizo. And what Peter's telling us, we need to be mentally prepared for battle, for action. But how do we prepare ourselves? How, what is the mindset that we're supposed to be preparing ourselves with? Well, he tells us that the mindset is supposed to be the mind of Christ. We're supposed to have the same mind as Christ. And that's, when we think about that, it's like, okay, what does that mean, Right? I mean, he, he tells us in verse 1, it says, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. That's a direct reference back to chapter 3, verse 18, where he's talking about, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. See, we need to have the same mindset as... In, to be able to face suffering and challenges like Jesus. Why? To bring us closer to God. That's why Jesus went through it. That's why he suffered, to bring us in closer to God, into a relationship with God. When we have the same mindset, it allows us to draw closer to God. And not only that, it allows us to help other people draw closer to God. So we need to be prepared for that. Craig Rochelle, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's a, he's a pastor. He says, your mind is a battlefield. And the battle for your life is always won or lost in your mind. See, we're all in a spiritual battle. Every moment of our lives, from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, we are in a battle. It's a spiritual battle. But the battle is fought right here. It's, it's fought in your mind. It's how we think, what we think about, how we think about the world around us, the people we interact with. This is where we win or lose our battles. And we're to win those spiritual battles, we need to be thinking like Christ. All right. Going on, says that, it, verse 2, he talks about, we cease from sin, no longer living for the flesh or human passions, but that we should be living for God. <clears throat> when we have the mind of Christ, that allows us, that gives us the ability, the strength, to be able to avoid sinning, to live no longer for our own desires. All right. When I read that, I think back to a letter Paul wrote to the, Roman, the Romans at that time. In Romans chapter 6, verses, starting in verse 6, he says, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. See, if we identify with Christ, then we've died to our sins. And that's what, that's what Peter's referring to here. We've died to our sins. We're no longer living for the flesh. And that's what Peter is reminding us of. And that brings up the second point that as exiles, as exiles living here, as followers of Jesus, we're going to be different. You know, as we've, the title we've given to this 
series in First Peter is exiles. This isn't our home. This, we don't live here anymore. We're not... We, we use the term exiles because that's, what, that's kind of what Peter uses. But in other, other parts of the New Testament, another term they use is ambassadors. I like ambassadors. It feels a little bit more dignified, right, than exile. But it's the same connotation. It's the same thought that this is not our home. We belong to another kingdom. Now, we're here. We're residing. And that means we need to be involved in interacting with the world we're in. We don't separate ourselves. But this is not our home. So that means we are going to be different. And, and Peter brings that out because it's, when we're different, you know, this, this means we're not stealth Christians. We're not walking around undercover, looking like the rest of the world, acting like the world, talking like the world. We're going to talk different. We're going to behave differently, and people are going to notice, and they're going to be like, what's up with you? Why don't you do the same thing that, that we all do? All right? At work, there's a couple of the guys, you know, trying to be friends and friendly with everyone. We'll get together in the morning and have like breakfast burritos around the table and all that. And there's a couple of them that on a regular basis, they're like, hey, we're going out for burgers after work. Do you want to go with? Sounds great. I'm always up for burgers. Where are you going? TDs. Nope. Not going to happen. Why not? I don't go to those places. And they look at me like, what do you mean you don't go to those places? I don't go to those places because to me, I'm trying to live my life that honors God and respects my wife. And that, that won't allow me to do that. You know, for some of us, it might be sitting at the lunch table with coworkers or something. And th this has happened in my life a couple of times where you're sitting there and it's lunch table at work is always a great place where people want to gossip, right? They want to talk about the person who's not there that day. And there's the times... People start talking about a manager or a supervisor, and it's like, ah, you know, guys, I'm going to eat lunch in my cubicle. Why? You, you too good to sit with us? And it's like, yeah, I'm not comfortable when you're talking about someone who's not here because everything that I say about people, I want, it, I want to be able to say the same thing to their face. Well, uh, uh, so, hey, hey, don't worry. You know, I tell them the same thing when they're talking about you. <laughs> I, I don't actually say that. I want to, but, you know. Sometimes we, you, you, there's that. I admit, I can sometimes have uh, snarky attitudes, and I, I try to, uh, you know, not be that way, but sometimes it gets the better of me. But what Peter's reminding us is that as we follow Jesus, we're going to be doing things different. We're not going to do things the way we once did. We see this in verse 3 and 4 where he says, For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they're surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. Reading through that list, the one thing I do want to point out is don't view this as a list of specific do's and don'ts. Otherwise, we have a tendency we want to turn it into a checklist. Well, I only do one of those. The others I'm good on. It's, it's not a list of... of these specific items don't do. I mean, I, you know, I don't know anyone who has orgies or whatever lawless idolatry is. But what it is, what Peter's referring to, he throws these out to speak about a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle that's void of self-control and discipline. You know, that's what the Bible refers to as sin. Sin is basically putting everything else, mainly ourselves, me, myself, and I, above what God says. And he's saying that that is what the rest of the world does. That's how the world lives. Let's, let's be honest, that's, that's how I lived before I became a Christian, and I think everyone here would say the same. You might have been a great person, but everything we did, even as a good person, was focused on what's going to benefit me, right? And what the Bible's saying is we should be thinking more about God. What is God calling us? And we will be different. So, Maybe for some of you, maybe some of these items kind of do describe your current frame of mind, how you live. I mean, not that you're having drinking parties weekly or that you're making all these bad choices, but maybe you are living to a large degree for yourself. What's going to get me ahead? What's going to promote me? Peter says that if we arm ourselves with the same mind as Christ, 
that if we are prepared, that that way of approaching life, the, the way of thinking for ourselves, the self-indulgent aspect, that that should be in our past, that that should change, that should no longer dictate our behavior and how we operate, but that we should be living according to God's will. And because of that, we will be different. The world won't understand you either. They will mock you. Uh, if you haven't figured that out now, I will let you know. They will mock you. Maybe to your face, maybe behind your back, but they will mock you. And Peter says, that, you know what, that's okay. Let them mock. They don't understand. Because what happens is that every one of them, believer and non-believer alike, we all have to stand before God at some point. We all have to give an answer for how we spent our lives. Either a life characterized by sin and self-indulgence or a life of obedience to the will of God. And he goes on to basically say that we won't have any excuse. We won't be able to stand before God and say, yeah, you know what, I didn't know. This wasn't explained to me. You know, he says, no, we will know. He goes on and, and says that they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I've read this passage a million times over the years, and I hit that, and I've always been like, what? Preaching to those who are dead? That's weird. I don't get it. And I've kind of glossed over, okay, God, maybe someday I'll understand. And I've moved on and continued reading the parts that make sense. But when you have to preach on something, you have to kind of understand what you're preaching. So I've spent time just reading this and studying and praying. It's like, okay, God, help me. What, what do you mean preaching to the dead? And we've been a teaching team and we've had discussions about it and just, you know, what is he talking about here? And I believe I got it. You know, thus saith Eric, the interpretation of Eric, you know, I, you know, don't take it to the bank, but I believe I have a good biblical foundation to say that I, I think I understand what he's saying here about preaching to the dead. He's talking to lost people. Because, and, and maybe some of you are like, hello, Eric, yeah, you didn't see that before? No, this was new to me, all right? When he's talking about preaching to the dead, he's talking about everyone who's not in a relationship with God. We were all spiritually dead at one point. You're spiritually dead until you hear the gospel, and the gospel, the Spirit of God, brings the Spirit of Christ alive in you. Then you're alive. Other than that, otherwise, you're dead. So he's talking about everyone hears the gospel. We should be proclaiming the gospel to everyone. And that's what he's talking about when it's like, you know, they, though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. He's saying, yeah, yeah, people in the flesh, people in the world, they're going to judge you because you're different, but you're living according to God. So uh, to me, that was just kind of like mind-blowing. Like, oh, okay, <laughs> good to know, God. I didn't see that before, but yeah, hey, we all learn something new on a regular basis, right? The point is, we want to be self-controlled rather than self-indulgent. And that brings us to the third point today, and that is that we need to be praying. We need to be praying. See, prayer isn't a tool that we use just when we're facing temptation. Although that is an awesome tool to use when you are in temptation in the midst of it. It's like, oh, Lord, help me get through this struggle. That is the best weapon we have at those times. But that's not the whole purpose of prayer. Neither is prayer just so that we can pronounce a blessing over the food that we're about to eat. Although we should give thanks for what God has provided for us. See, prayer is foundational to the life of a believer. It is the way that we communicate with God. We have our Bible, and God will speak to us through the Bible but communication is a two-way street. It's prayer is how we communicate with God. And quite honestly, as I'm reading this and I'm praying, that's when God makes this come alive. That's when I read stuff about preaching to the dead and I'm like, I don't understand it. And I pray and God's like, means this. Oh, cool. Prayer is foundational. We should all be praying on a regular basis. For example, kind of a, an illustration. 25 years ago, I stood at an altar, looked at my beautiful wife, Sulema, and I said, I do. <laughs> and during the past 25 years, 
during that time, if I rarely spoke to her, except maybe once a week on a Sunday morning or something, and just, you know, hey, how you doing? You know, can you make me food? Can you do this for me? Wash my clothes? You know, here's my laundry list of needs. I think it would be fair to say that I'm not really married to her. I mean, that was a great place to say amen, Salema, but you missed it. Sorry. <laughs> Same way if we come to God and we say, you know, we can look back and we tell everyone, oh, on this day, at this hour, I accepted Christ. I looked God in the eye and I said, you know what, Jesus, I do. But then we don't spend time talking with him, don't spend time communicating with him. I'll leave it there. I don't, I don't think I need to expound upon that anymore. See, one thing that keeps us from praying consistently, at least I know in my life, is that when we're living like the rest of the world, it be, kind of becomes hard to pray. And the thing is, when I'm not praying, I begin to live like the rest of the world. It's this vicious cycle. I'm not praying consistently. I begin to act and talk and look like everyone else at work. And then because of that, I'm feeling guilty, so I avoid God and I don't pray to him. And it's just this downward spiral. Aspire Church, we need to be different. God's calling us to be different. God's calling us to live a life of prayer. Prayer should be an identifying aspect of our lives. And here's the thing. If you've gotten off course somewhere along the way and you're like, you know what, I, I don't pray like I should. And I don't need a show of hands because I talk to enough of you and I can say this in my own life, that it happens at times. But on a regular basis when I'm talking with people in small group or outside a small group, a lot of you have the same prayer request. Hey, can you just pray for me? I'm, I really need to be more consistent. Yeah, put me in that, that category too. We all need to be praying more consistent. Now, I also know that some of you are prayer warriors. There's some of you in this church that you have your, your schedule, you're praying, you have a, a prayer journal, you know who you're praying for on any given day of the week, and I say, amen, awesome, but I want to challenge you too. I want to challenge you to pray more because the leadership of this church, we need your prayers. This church needs your prayers. This city, this nation we need prayers. We need more prayer warriors. We need people to step up. If you're, if you're not a prayer warrior, go find someone who is and say, hey, you know what? Can you dis disciple me? Help me. Call me up. Help, let's set a time when I can, you know, call me, remind me, hey, have you prayed yet? No. Okay, take five minutes. Pray. We need more prayer. Because here's the thing. In the addition to being prepared, being mentally armed for the spiritual battle that we're in, being different and praying consistently, all of this is because we need to be on mission. Point four today is we need to be on mission. There is a purpose to all of this. Verses 8 through 11 says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves, as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We're on mission when we walk in love with one another. Choosing to look past someone's faults. Choosing to look past those things that might irritate us. I don't like going to small group because there's just that one person. They just rub me the wrong way. Look past it. We're supposed to be walking in love. And sometimes love doesn't mean you have to be buddy-buddy and go out to lunch with them on a regular basis, but it means you, need to, you just need to be kind. You need to look past the, their faults, their issues, because, you know, I guarantee you guys have faults and issues too. So do I. We all do. Let's just walk in love with one another. And one thing he points out, it's, it's this, again, I love this passage because in our small groups, we're always talking about one another's. This passage is filled with one another's. It's how we, how we are interacting, not only with the world, but with each other. And one of the things we need to do is we need to walk in love with one another. We're also on mission when we're hospitable, without grumbling, right? Hosp hospitality is when you make a guest feel welcome. 
So many of you open up your home on a regular basis for small groups, you know, and it, you're like, I'm not leading. I, I am not comfortable leading a small group, but you're welcome to come and use my house for a small group. That's hospitality, right? I mean, doesn't mean the house has to be perfectly clean. Doesn't mean everything has to be spotless and in its place. It just means when people show up, they feel comfortable. I mean, we can all probably think of places we've been where we, we, oh, come on in, and we sit down, and we're almost afraid to sit comfortably in the seat. When you want to sit on the edge, it's like I might, you know, I'm just not comfortable because they, it's not a very warm and welcoming environment. And then there's other places you go to, and they welcome you in, and you're just like, wow, this is, I feel like I can just kick my shoes off, put my feet up on the coffee table, and no one will, everything will be fine. It's, it's that hospitality. We also need to have that here at church. Those of you who are part of the hospitality aspect, you guys do a tremendous job. From the point, from the time someone hits the parking lot all the way in, we have people just greeting you and saying hi. Hey, good to see you. How have you been? Tell me about your week. It's hospitality, Right? Being on mission also means that we take the responsibility to identify our own gifts. A month or so ago, we went through a training thing, and a lot of you joined in and you went through to find out what are your spiritual gifts, what are your, your physical, natural gifts as well. And then we take on this responsibility, this intention of like, okay, if this is my gift, how do I use it? How do I use it not just in the workplace where we live, work, and play, but also how do I use it in the church? How do I use it to, to be a blessing to others, right? Because here's the thing. Aspire Church isn't just a few of us leaders and a couple volunteers. You guys are Aspire Church. You are the church. And that means you have a gift or ability that needs to be used, that the church needs. Now, probably going to step out on a limb here and probably offend some of you, but everyone should be serving at Aspire without exception. If you call Aspire Church your family, your home, you should be serving. And if you get offended, that's actually probably a conviction of the Holy Spirit, I would say, because we see this throughout New Testament. The entire church, the entire body of believers served one another. They helped one another. They got involved. They did something. Now, if you're like, oh, Eric, Aspire Church isn't my home. You know what? You're welcome here as long as you're looking for a home. If you haven't found that church home yet, hey, come join, hear the word of God, get involved. But I would encourage you, find a church home and then get involved. Be all in with wherever God places you. But if you do say Aspire is your home, need to, need to serve somewhere. Oh, but Eric, I am not good with kids. Changing diapers, no way. Not going to be for me. Fine. You don't need to work with kids. We have door greeters. We have people that, like I talked about, hospitality. Are you able to smile and say hello to someone and actually look like you mean it? Then yes, we have a place for you. And again, serving doesn't mean you serve every week or every month, but it does mean you, there is a consistency to serving, to helping out, to being a part of the church. I mean, are you able to fold curtains for teardown? It takes a couple minutes. I want to say, last week, Brian challenged everyone to, hey, at the end of service, grab your chair and stack it. And it, everyone jumped in and did it. I mean, some of you, I mean, almost were laughing while you're doing it. It looked like you guys were almost having fun. It was over like that. And you know what? That was a huge blessing to the teardown team. It helped tremendously. And I'm going to challenge you guys and say, you know what? I'm, I'm sure when Rob comes up at the end of service, he's going to remind everyone, hey, help stack chairs. I want to encourage you guys to not only do it this Sunday, but make it a habit. Every Sunday, just grab a chair and stack it. And once you've done that, it's like, well, hey, wh how, where else can I help? Can I help tear down with some of the, the curtains? Oh, what about setting up? How many of you enjoy the like little hand lotions and soap and little actual towels in the bathrooms, right? Those are awesome. L that little touch, th those don't belong to the school. That, someone goes and sets that up every week. Can you do something like that? Can you help out with that? Jump in. You know, I, I, I want to challenge you to, to be all in. That's what it means to be on mission. Be all in. Be involved in what we as a church are doing and moving forward. Right? Again, I want to encourage you that if Aspire isn't your home, though, or you're just visiting, you know what? Still, still come and just attend. Be comfortable. 
this is a great church. I know I'm a little biased, but Aspire is a great church, and it's, it is open for membership at all times. If you're looking for a home church, this is a great one to get involved in. Here's the thing. If you're here this morning, though, and you would say, you know what, I'm not a Christian. I'm, I'm not even know, sure if I'm even looking for a home church at this point. I'm just here to f- kind of find out, you know, if this is something I want to get involved in. You are. God is calling you. If you're here this morning, it's because God has called you and brought you here. And I want to tell you, you have an opportunity to join us. See, I don't view Aspire as a church. I view it as a family. You guys are my family. Because, you know, what? when stuff is going on in my life, I don't call my biological family to come help me out. I call you guys, and you guys are there. And I, what, what, how else can we help? What else can we do? Aspire is a family. And I want to encourage you that if you're not sure if you're a Christian or not, you're welcome to join us. This morning, as the band comes up and we're getting ready to take communion, you have an opportunity. I want to encourage you that if you're not sure if you're a Christian or if, or if that's even what you want to do, come talk to us. Come pray with us. I'm going to have Rob and McKenna and myself. We're going to be at the back during communion, and I would encourage you to come pray with one of us. The reason why I'm having us at the back is because I know sometimes it's intimidating to come up when everyone's watching, right? And I want to make it, I want to make it safe for you. I want to make you if, you, if you're dealing with God's working in your heart, feel comfortable to come back, and please don't leave here unless you've come talked and prayed with one of us. I also want to just mention that maybe as we're going through some of this, maybe some of you have also, the part where we're talking about praying consistently, and you're like, yeah, you know what? I'm, I have gotten off track, and I want to get back on track. I want, to, I, want to, I want to tell God I'm all in. I already said I do. Now I want to be like, I'm all in. I want to go all the way. You know what? There's no condemnation. We've all been there. Probably we'll do it again at some point in the future. Hopefully not, but that's reality. We get distracted. But I would say if that's you and you want someone to just come alongside you and just pray with you about that as well and say, you know what, I'm, I want that consistency. I, I want to be prepared for what's ahead. I want to be mentally prepared. I want to be different. I want to let my life be different to the world around me. I want to be praying and I want to be on mission. We'll be in the back to pray with you as well. During that time, though, as we we come prepare for communion. The Bible tells us that we should prepare our hearts. Before we come to the communion table, that we should prepare our hearts, make sure that our hearts are right with God and with each other. And I would encourage you that if, if you're at odds with someone, go to them, make things right before you come and take communion. And maybe it's, you need to make things right with God and just take a moment. So we're going to take communion and just be willing to take some time and just talk to God and just say, you know what, God, here I am. I'm all in. And as you're ready, as the band plays, as you're ready, we will go ahead. You can come up. You can come down. We have two tables here. And feel free to take a piece of the bread and dip it in the juice. And then you can go back to your seat. Uh, Personally, I always like to go back and I just take a moment while I'm holding the elements. And I just kind of, I just take a moment and just talk to God. And then uh, usually my wife and I will take communion together. So with that, let me pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your word, for, Father, this, this book of 1 Peter, Lord, it's, it's been speaking to me the past several weeks that this world is not my home. We are exiles here. And that means that we're going to be living different, that we will go through some suffering, we'll go through some hard times, but that we should be living a life submitted to you. And Father, and we just thank you for that. And Lord, I just pray that if there's anyone here that just wants to just get right with you, get back on track, that they'll take that step. And the rest of us, Father, I just pray that you would just strengthen us, encourage us to, to be all in, to take, take it one notch up, take it one notch higher. And in all of this, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.